So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 120, which is a really great group chat that we just had with Hema Shepard, who's a co-founder of HelloFresh and Bridebook. So HelloFresh is a leading meal kit delivery service that scaled worldwide. Hamish is also more recently the co-founder of Bridebook, which is the UK's number one wedding planning app and marketplace. So this is a really great chat with Hamish, where we got to learn more about his experience scaling, scaling HelloFresh, key learnings that he's taken with him to Bridebook, did a deep dive into Bridebook as a wedding marketplace, and also had a really great group Q&A. So really enjoyed this conversation. You know you're going to find a great watch to the end. So Hamish, welcome to the uh, group chat. You know, you have some uh, really incredible experience with uh, HelloFresh and also uh, Bridebook. So I'm really excited to uh, have you join us here today and uh, dive into things. Before we do, though, I think it might be great if you can uh, start off by sharing a little bit more on your uh, background, though, for those that I don't know you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Mike, for having me. Absolute pleasure. Um, hi, I'm Hamish. So I'm the founder of Bridebook and, and previously, uh, and we're a, a wedding platform, uh, the largest in Europe and, and slowly going around the world. Um, before that, I co-founded HelloFresh, the recipe kit company that hopefully many of you have tried. But to whiz back this very start of my career, um, I, uh, I once was an investment banker. I joined investment banking the day after Lehman Brothers had gone bust. And, and that taught me a few things about what not to do if you ever uh, start a company every day. I vow my company won't uh, be anything like uh, UBS. Uh, then listening, uh, not a nice place to work. I'm um, encouraging people not to uh, not go into investment banking uh, when the whole place uh, is collapsing. But um, from there, more interesting is I launched an event venue with my brothers by coincidence, which is actually exactly where I'm sitting uh, today. Uh, and we launched as a corporate event venue um, just before the credit crunch, which obviously sort of wiped it out. And that's where we discovered uh, weddings was basically the only events taking place and worked really hard on this rundown building the first time, first few times, uh, first events we hosted for weddings, you had to bring your own furniture. Um, we charged your gas and electricity meter readings and things like that. And really were three blueness brothers, um, suddenly hosting weddings. Uh, if you wind forward, uh, 14 years now. Uh, we're the number one wedding venue in the UK. We're one of the, Lone just said we're top five in the world. You would have seen us get filmed in lots of movies and, and, and the Crown and Downton Abbey and so very British stuff like that. But that whole journey from being a rundown event venue was the seed of understanding this sort of strange industry that most people overlook, the wedding industry. And when the time came to sort of take it on and try and that, improved it significantly, which hopefully we're well in the, the midst of doing. But anyway, I left banking, worked on the venue, which, which started uh, sort of surviving and now it's thriving and my one of my brothers still runs it. Um, and then actually the opportunity uh, uh, or the idea or well, opportunity really to go and help launch some pet companies. And I moved to Asia and launched uh, uh, the equivalent of Amazon called Lazada in Southeast Asia um, and was based in Vietnam and we launched in 11 countries in the end and it's now owned by Alibaba and one of the, it's one of the largest companies in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then from, you know, learning some tech, had my banking background, had sort of DNA of, of, of starting stuff, I uh, actually moved to New York and that's when I was uh, co-founder of HelloFresh. Uh, we'd launched in Germany we were the first company uh, who did that model. By the end of, of uh, by, the, by the sort of maturity of the journey, we had 150 competitors in America. So uh, um, pretty quickly, it was quite a battle. Um, but again, that journey was, was, was wild. It started off uh, me and a, a couple of other people uh, renting a zip card, driving to a Tropicana warehouse outside Atlantic City, be like, right, Mike, you put fish in the box, I'll put carrots in the box. Let's hope we're not wasting someone food poisoning. Um, you know, two years later, the call center for boxes with issues uh, was 180 people. Uh, last year, we sent a billion meals out. So uh, it was 
really fortunately as a listed company now on the DAX Frankfurt uh, Stock Exchange. Um, but on that journey, that's when I'd moved moved out to America, told my girlfriend um, I would uh, be gone for six weeks and I was abroad for three and a half years. And uh, it's time to come home. Uh, knew some HelloFresh back to the UK where I'm based. Uh, knew some of the HelloFresh investors as well and, and said, um, you know, there's just this strange industry, the wedding industry that's enormous, completely overlooked. You know, millions of people go through it. There are 30 million weddings a year in the world. Uh, most people, you know, only plan on doing it once. It's extremely expensive. You don't know what you're doing. You head into this unknown world and uh, and it's incredibly challenging. And then from the businesses, um, it's a huge challenge because you have no repeat business because your customers are only planning on getting married once. And even if they get married again, they won't come back to you. So you're a small business with a hundred percent churn of your customer base. So it's a really difficult industry to operate in as a small business. Um, so said, right, maybe we can build a platform to help with this, help the couples know what they're doing, help the businesses, um, thrive. And, uh, that was a, a couple of years before COVID, uh, COVID made it pretty challenging. Weddings were banned for two years. Uh, but, um, where we are today, uh, you know, where we're still on our journey to concrete in the wedding world and, and helping a lot of people have an amazing time and helping a lot of small businesses thrive. Yeah, that's, uh, that's quite the background and uh, thanks for sharing with us on that. So a uh, lot we're going to jump into and you did uh, mention some of the specific kind of challenges with Brightbook and, and whatnot also. But, uh, you know, to kind of go back to a HelloFresh though, because that's of course, uh, you know, something that uh, m- many of us have heard of and probably also used. You know, what, what would you say some of the biggest kind of learnings, you know, from your journey at HelloFresh that you've kind of taken with you to uh, Bridebook were? Yeah, so that's uh, two great, great sort of stories really from it, uh, which are really useful. Uh, one is is just like perseverance. I'm sure everyone on this tool running your own company is, is pretty brutal and exhausting. Uh, HelloFresh was incredibly challenging. We were doing a $70 a week subscription that hadn't been launched before and we're posting you raw food, which is a very like far challenge. This didn't really exist. There's fresh direct in New York, but nothing really else. Um, and that was grocery delivery. This wasn't, wasn't being shipped to you. Um, so trying to find product market fit, trying to find the customer base was, was exhausting something I I led on very focused on marketing. Um, and that perseverance of, in our first year, we did 650 partnerships with HelloFresh. We tested every single possibility you could ever imagine, saying, right, is it here, is it there? And, and 95% failed. So anyone sane would, would give up, but I think probably people on this call and something I hope I'm pretty strong at is just that perseverance of finishing something exhausting like that and being like, brilliant. I'm the most stubborn person on the planet. I know what 5% works now and everyone else will be given up on the journey. And and knowing that was the crux of what allowed uh, HelloFresh to really scale. We had launched in Manhattan. And this is the sort of um, the, the second part of, of what I was going to mention is with recording and everyone will be doing this, uh, but like recording as much data as you possibly can. And the really sort of uh, more sort of furious data points early on, just record as much as possible. And we've enormously taken that into Brybook. So even with HelloFresh, just give you a taste. We were given out, I'm sure loads of you have been given HelloFresh gift cards. Those were in batches of 500 and we were giving them out on the street and we'd be recording, you know, what was the weather like? What was the time of day? What was the position in Manhattan? Then it'd be going into magazines. We were measuring, is it landscape? Is it portrait? Has it got a vegetarian meal or a, or a, a, a carnivorous meal, a meat dish on it? Was it a dollar discount or a percentage discount or a, a free meal discount? Uh, all of that. And at that early stage, you're like, it's just, this just is immaterial. Like, how am I supposed to judge it in such a small sample size? Once you get up to that larger scale, that taught us really quickly or quite quickly, um, 
we're in the wrong city. We're in Manhattan. The best audience for us is, or, or was at this earlier stage, you know, a much broader company, but like the early stage is like, we need to find 41 year olds, generally female audience with a settled lifestyle. And, and that taught us from being in magazines and knowing the right audiences. You want to be in a car centric city because that means going grocery shopping is a real flat. If you're a bit older, you have a more settled life. If you've got kids, it's really settled. If you've got a dog, it's settled as well. And actually, some of you would have known uh, one of our sort of competitors at the time called Blue Apron. And we're there feeling really threatened. Like, shit, they were doing, sorry, sorry. Uh, they were doing like uh, great brand marketing and cooking with cactus, I remember, and doing celebrity chef partnerships. And we were there sort of not zooming in on that audience and not that Manhattanite audience. And actually had found, I think, through our data, this is now eight, nine years ago, uh, that that repeat customer, the, the base that was going to build HelloFresh, is in Pittsburgh. I remember going and doing field sales in Pittsburgh in the freezing cold, going off to all sorts of you know strange parts of I went to go to strange parts, but bits I didn't think I'd ever go to. We went all over the place um, and discovered that's where like that like amazing retained customer was. But all of that then taught us like, right, it's go time. This works. Let's get into the Midwest. Let's get to the West Coast. Let's let's get all over America. And and now HelloFresh is in uh, uh, 17 countries around the world. It's most recently North Japan and. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's really great, and I can only uh, imagine back in the uh, in the early days. Um, so you did mention the uh, no to competition. I guess it's uh, you know, relevant to just kind of you know, uh, I guess for us all to kind of realize that you were so early in the space, right? Um, how do you think uh, you know, like access to kind of capital and then you know competition uh, impacted uh, you know, like the early days at, of uh, HelloFresh and maybe even kind of like the market? Yeah, so so I think an, another lesson from from HelloFresh, which is a, is a relevant one for, for Breitbart, is HelloFresh was an, in, an intensely, uh, a highly capital intense business. Okay, so when we're building a, a, a warehouse distribution center in New Jersey, that cost $30 million, only $3 million, and we had big like subsidies and things like that. Um, to acquire a customer, the customer acquisition cost getting someone Acquired a seventy dollars subscription was over a hundred dollars, so we did have to raise a lot of money, and that's where I deal with marketplaces. Being, you know, depends on your marketplace. But most marketplaces are like, you know, ideally very uh, uh, um, capital efficient businesses. That's definitely a learning, and that was, you know, it did become a bit of an arms race. We all raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in the end, um, because you have to do that because. You know, you're building like full infrastructure to to be able to, you know, it's a it's a full service business. It's vertically integrated, brilliant. Um, that costs a lot. Yeah, definitely. So I feel like uh, we could probably get into the to the weeds on uh, HelloFresh, but uh, you know, really excited to <laughs> talk about uh, about Bridebook here. And, uh, you know, I've done a lot of research on it. It seems like a, you know, really cool marketplace. Um, so could you uh, maybe give us like an overview of Brightbook today and then uh, kind of take us back to, you know, the early days and the founding story? Yeah, yeah, very cool. So so I probably I'll just go from the founding story and show you what, what we are. So so we're, a, we're a, for, for couples, we're a wedding planning app to help them organize their wedding and, and they can manage their guests, their budget, their checklist. With celebrity experts, you have Bobby Brown teaching you on makeup, Spotify, on, on music, all sorts of different pieces like that. They're going to guide you through the journey. It's really complex. It's really expensive. It's really emotionally important. So you don't want it to go wrong. You can either start on a blank spreadsheet, which is pretty terrifying, and how most people have done it in history, or we're doing that huge sort of, uh, you know. Um, sort of knowledge base and and uh, network effect of each user's improving it to the next user. So you have that part of the product. What that allows us to then do is learn a lot about the couples and do hyper valuable recommendations into the marketplace. So we've broken down your budget. You can on average book 13 to 19 businesses. When you plan your wedding, then you cater a florist 
hair, makeup, everything is really complex. So there's a lot of organization there, but also finding the right businesses for you um, because you've used our planning tools that allows you to then go into the marketplace and us to most effectively serve you to that audience. And then on the businesses side, they have this complex problem I mentioned before where they don't have any repeat custom. That's, that's the crux of the whole thing. Um, so they're always having to find new customers and these customers have very specific demands. So before there was any marketplace or platform like ours, they're having to do their own self-promotion. Imagine if you had to run your own Google ads to sell your apartment rather than listing it on Zillow, it'd be a nightmare if they're you went on Instagram now and it had Mike's apartment for sale, it would feel like this is wrong. You need to go to, 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 to a platform. So that's how it all connects together. If you look at where we are now, um, uh, yeah, so, so now we, we plan 1.6 million weddings. We, we, we have couples all over the world and, um, yeah, every day we're, we're, you know, optimizing the product make it a better experience the earliest days and back to back to the sort of very beginning of the story just launched a very basic desktop beta links to downloadable templates and things like that and and said you know let's see if we can get 100 couples to sign up in the first three months and we'll just keep an eye on them like this and early hello fresh people what are they actually doing you know ring them all up and find out you know get some actual feedback. Um, and in the first week, 3000 couples signed up and, and, uh, yeah, and it's been off and now we're, we're now helping plan 71% of UK weddings and, um, and then the planning products all over the world and completely organically. Now we're planning like 28,000 Malaysian weddings and 21,000 Turkish weddings. And, you know, we never even run an ad there. So, um, yeah, there's sort of found the product market fit on the consumer product. And then it's taking that demand in a really effective way into the marketplace. Because we have a lot of information, we can then serve it really effectively and get like a brilliant ROI to the businesses better than they've ever had or ever done on their own. There are alternatives with things like print media and stuff like that, which is just sort of highly ineffective for, for a niche business with, when the couples have like really targeted demands. Yes. So you did mention, uh, you know, those first kind of like 3000 people that signed up. Right. So mm -hmm. how did you kind of go from, uh, you know, initially kind of like attracting, uh, you know, this, this first kind of, uh, 3000 people. And then did you say, Hey, okay, we have the demand. Now we're going to go, you know, get the suppliers and the venues and, and all the different providers, or how did you kind of, uh, I would say like kind of, you know, uh, solve for the, uh, you know, chicken and the egg or the, uh, cold star problem there. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, the, the exact scenario was like, Brilliant, it worked. You know, I was right, or I had a moment of that. It was like, shit, now we've got to go away and build it properly. And basically, we left, uh, or, you know, or, you know, we didn't carry a market or whatever. The whole thing really was a sort of, you know, close to a trapdoor test, and then went away and actually built it out really properly over, 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 over a year, actually, before we came back. Um, the, uh, the key bit we've done, so we're a market network. So this concept NFX have written about quite a bit, which is where we have these workflow tools and then the marketplace. And what's maybe you know, advanced about our model is couples still get a lot of value from just the workflow tools without any marketplace, which means we can solve the chicken and egg problem because we can get all the chickens and then go and talk to the suppliers and already say we've got them to then get the eggs on or whatever the right analogy is. Um, uh, another company that, that I've seen do this is Howls, the, um, the uh, um, so interiors platform, where it's like they have a great inspiration product where you can go have a sort of lot of fun on it. They did brilliantly on that long before you went into them, you know, or long before they started plugging in an e-commerce marketplace now and a vendor marketplace and they plug that all in. They also had that just sort of huge organic uh, demand a little bit like a sort of um, a Pinterest or, or a social media platform 
before you added ads. So we all had fun on Instagram and then we're all annoyed when they added ads one day. It's almost a sort of marketplace version of that. Yeah. So I guess, uh, would you call it a SaaS enabled marketplace or? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Yeah. And on the, on the, uh, so, so I guess like, uh, you know, you have your, like your, your demands, um, which gets the kind of value from the, from the, uh, from the planning tools. Um, but on the supply side, you know, is, uh, how, how are you kind of, uh, acquiring supply? So wedding is the most lucrative business for hospitality business and has the longest lead time and has the largest basket size. So the whole hospitality industry would love more wedding business on general, the vast majority of businesses do. So what will happen is a couple will inquire to a venue and then the venue, uh, will see a lot of information about that couple because we know huge amounts about them. If they're not already registered with us, they just say, we just say, you know, choose a password and you can reply to this couple and that's how we get our, our acquisition. And then there's lots of opportunities for them to better target couples. They can say, I want to fill up my Thursdays in 2024 to couples with this budget who've only got a hundred guests, up, up, up. Um, we're, we're able to do that, which is, which is incredibly useful for, uh, for the businesses. And then that goes on. That's maybe talking more for venues, but then for someone like photographers, they can say, I want to target couples who are getting married at this certain venue, which is incredibly unique for them. And, and it creates this big network effect and it's incredibly valuable for the couples because uh you know they're they're getting really valuable you know they're like getting highly targeted recommendations rather than just sort of noise they're not just looking at you know a lot of previous stuff has been like search for a photographer by zip code but you know photographers travel who cares where they live like you want to know can they come to you and that's where we sort of moved it into the next generation yeah, that's a really interesting. Sounds like it has a, a interesting kind of network effect, uh, you know, with so many different uh, providers that could be involved with each, you know, uh, I guess, um, you know, wedding that's being planned. So on that note, yeah, like how many, how many providers could be, you know, part of one wedding uh, that are, that they kind of connect uh, through Bridebook? The average wedding is 13 to 19 businesses involved in it. So, you know, we could all go around the circle, you'd be able to name them all, but the car, the cake, the flowers, the pop up, you know, there, there's all that world and you can go bigger and bigger. You know, we've had a, we had a, a, a groom recently whose, whose partner uh, loved dinosaurs. So he arranged a robotic velociraptor to join them for their first dance on the dance floor. So, you know, maybe they had 20 suppliers, but, uh, and weddings, a lot due to social media, the average wedding budget's doubled. Um, I think Pinterest now has 19 billion wedding photos on it, some crazy number like that. So people, you know, dream big, experience economy, um, and uh, yeah, a lot of that gets pushed into into showing off your identity through your wedding, and sky's the limit. Yeah, I can only imagine some of the weddings I'm sure that you've seen uh, planned. So yeah, yeah, we've seen some, seen some good one. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like also too that there is some kind of component as be, as far as being like a hyperlocal marketplace. Um, and you did mention, uh, I guess, or, or or you know, how many markets do you operate in again? So we have weddings, and now in every country in the world, the way it, the way it, um, or a uh, hundred and ten countries or something like that. Um, the way it works is some countries we will just turn on our planning tools and then in other countries we'll go deep on a marketplace basically choosing oh we only have we don't have enough chickens in that market to bother turning it on and uh, uh and not bother turning it on rather bringing the supply base on because they're not going to get any value uh and then we can choose right how how's it going america's a very competitive market and if any plans are going to america um the main reason is registry is very big in your country. Uh, so uh, product, people buy lots of gifts, it's extremely expensive. And that means there's huge, this big a battle in America for um, couples and Macy's and Bloomingdale's and Zola and Joy and, um, and Amazon now and things like that. Uh, the rest of the world is less focused on that sort of big registry piece and guest piece. It's much more of the problem is finding your suppliers. 
Um, so that's why we have a sort of bit of a different approach to, to, to America. Yeah, you uh, you answered my question. So I was going to ask about how the markets might be different, and then the uh, you know yeah, kind yeah. of a market launch and expansion kind of playbook there. Uh, we would love to do America. Uh, sorry, we'd love to do India, and and but but there you have uh, a wedding as a multi-day event. They have multiple events, and that starts creating product challenges. And yeah, so there, there's some differences. We've got to be inclusive to everyone because. Indian weddings don't just happen in India. We have loads of Indian weddings in the UK. We already have loads of Indian weddings on Pride. We've got to make the product work globally. And then, yeah, you know, then um, otherwise we'll just grind to a halt. Trying to, you know, go too local in each market means, you know, you can never actually build a global product. So it sounds like, uh, you know, you're at some, uh, you know, large sense of scale and, uh, you know, big opportunity. So what is the uh, team like today? So, so we're uh, broken down. We don't talk too much about uh, our team, but um, uh, well, yeah, we have a sort of core, we call it centralized, where it's focused on uh, product and engineering. And then when we, uh, um, then we'll have marketplace teams for more about building community, building the vendor base, making sure they're happy. And then if we, if we had, um, monetizing it they will uh will have a sort of uh sales team got it got it hey so uh one thing i did uh want to mention too i know uh right before we started recording i was uh saying that i watched some of your uh you know your videos talking about the uh the, the kind of uh, pandemic presentation that you were doing uh, previously so you know how has that uh, impacted your business um and uh you know and then kind of more re recently with things yeah so so uh uh two and two of nice one it was a complete disaster. Our, our our industry was closed for two years. Um, we, you know, we, yeah, from from, and and even you could look at it as sort of closed for three years. So, the wedding industry is very seasonal. So from September 2019 is really the end of the the wedding season. The next wedding season was June 22 this year or May 22 this year. So it's like incredibly brutal for the industry. Um, but we actually spent a lot of time working with the industry. We helped, we launched associations, we launched training, we launched tons of product um, to help the industry through. We've got a lot of goodwill from that, but it's also been really valuable for getting to understand the industry. But what is meant on the other side is actually the uh, industry has modernized a lot, has taken on technology. Lots of remote show rounds is very normal now with Zoom and um team chat and slack integrations blah, 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 is is all very normal whereas the industry was a, a real laggard on technology before COVID. um and then probably what's what we're fortunate with at the moment is due to the covid backlog so this year and next year the busiest years of weddings in history whilst there's this very tough time uh, in the economic environment actually due to the long lead times most you know, uh, uh, there's still this huge wave of business coming through, like above mean uh, level of business. Um, and actually, we still see uh, um, couples' budgets are incredibly resilient. Couples' budgets are still up. I mean, this quarter, they're the highest they've ever been. So actually, whilst there's this challenging time in Europe, especially wedding businesses like wedding venues, energy costs are incredibly high at the moment. And these are big, large, old buildings generally, which is a challenge. Uh, but luckily, they're being buffered by wedding business being resilient and actually being way above normal, the, the level of it. Uh, whereas something like corporate business, like Christmas parties, people like dial back or switch them off, or let's just do a Zoom meeting rather than an away day. And and that's much tougher for, for that section of the sort of hospitality industry. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. So we're going to get into uh, some uh, questions here because we have a few that want to come on. Um, but, you know, right before we do, so uh, you, of course, have some really awesome experience with the HelloFresh and now uh, Brybook. So do you have any uh, tips for uh, earlier stage marketplace founders um, that you'd like to share that might be helpful? Uh, having a really narrow focus at the start and just hunting for product market fit and getting to know your users as, as much as you possibly can. I'm sure, you know, there are a million books that can better explain that to me, but I've really sort of lived that of, of of 
sitting there and listening to your customers and not being afraid to get on the phone and ring someone up or email someone directly or just say, here's, we would get on a WhatsApp. I've got a WhatsApp group with a hundred brides and grooms and people would be like, God, that's so intrusive or you know, shouldn't you be doing more important stuff? But it keeps my like, finger completely on the pulse and any second I'd say, what a weird idea. I'll just message, what do you think of this? And it's like a super power. I've got a Facebook group with 12,000 brides in it. I could say, I had a weird idea. Trying to create those communities, even if it's five friends and then hopefully it's five users and then hopefully it's a hundred users and just constantly uh, checking that it's you know it's it, it ends up being like such a secret or such a superpower and seems so like basic but it's just like people just tell you the answer if you're wondering something you just ask 10 people and you're like oh, what obvious option a is the right one because that's what they all want and i might have thought option b was right but now i know like i'm wrong look then my ego and now just go ask them for answers every time uh and then the other ones I'd mention is like uh, think a lot, think a lot, and this might sound strange early on, but trying to think about sequencing. I, you know, trying to help lots of early stage founders. Um, and I think everyone who's entrepreneurial is like optimistic, is creative, got big ideas, and wants to do everything as quickly as possibly can. And I'm one of those people um, I, myself, with some brilliant people around me. One of the things they've helped enormously with, and especially like sounding boarding with investors being like, right, well, we want to conquer the world. You know, what's the order to doing it? Oh, you've got these 10 brilliant ideas. Actually, which one should you do first? Which one unlocks? Or, you know, if you're, if you're trying to unblock the river, start with the dam at the top, and that water will help knock the next dam down. And by the fifth dam, the water just does it itself. And you're trying to go up the other way or trying to do them all at once just like knackering you never know if you're making progress team will get like frustrated um so it's just like right what it, you know and you know hello fresh people are still can't know what, why don't you do this why don't you do that why is it still uh, it's a box most people are getting three meals you know they've just added desserts a bit of this bit of that blue apron you know was doing desserts and wine pairings and ready meals five six years before us it was like oh yeah like you're just like keep it simple get your get your get your um get the i don't know what it is you just keep sharpening your spear go 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 before you start trying to put everything else in um and just spending a moment as early as you possibly can think about that can save you like years in the long run yeah those are uh those are really great tips so i uh, de definitely uh so, some that we need to we need to hear and uh reinforce here cool hey um olivia do you uh want to come on yeah for sure thanks thanks mike uh thanks so much Hamish, today for you know all the insights i'm off camera right now i'm kind of in a busy place but um i i, have, I was curious about pricing so you know you spoke a little bit about hello fresh and I, I was just wondering how you thought about pricing on in the early days for HelloFresh. So did it always start as a subscription or did, did that kind of come later on? I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, your pricing strategy and, and how that might have evolved. Yeah, so so it's quite a simple answer. It was, it was always a subscription. Um, and that's the only way the economics could work. And quite quickly, you could see that. The, the pieces I would... Uh, highlight that I could sort of like learning was um, originally we're, we're a subscription and we're nervous about making it too obvious that it's a subscription and might scare people off and actually and we had a big debate once and and we wanted to put like you can cancel any time above the checkout button and conversion went through the roof from doing that because people could smell oh it's a subscription and what's going on here and I'm going to get stuck in when it was actually like up front and you could cancel, you still can and cancel whenever you want. Suddenly people had that like confidence. Yeah, I am going to try it and not worry about what have I actually signed up to. Um, but it was always a subscription and that's that's the, the challenge of of the business model to make. Uh, it's a high acquisition cost. So you need people to order more than once for it to, to you know, have a positive LTV over cash. 
Yeah. Okay. Great. And then when you were thinking about like launching in new markets, did the pricing change at all from like market to market or was it kind of across the board, always subscription, or did you kind of play around oh, in yeah. different markets? I, I was only ever, um, focused on the U S market actually. And, and the pricing in America was always the same in every market. It was different. If you ordered vegetarian, uh, it was different if, um, uh, as a family box, you got five meals or more portions or, or things like that. And you start to get a, a discount on a per cost meal, um, a meal cost even. But um, uh, it definitely you know, would have taken in out, you know, bulks in different countries and things like that. But uh, um, nothing I was, you know, that close to. Um, the thing that we were much more testing on was on discounts with HelloFresh, you saw uh, if you had one box, when we first started, if you had one box uh, of something like 70% of people never got another box. So it's like brutal. However, if someone got a third box, on average, they'd order at least 20 more because they'd seen the value of the product. They started to see, oh, this is great. We've had these really fun meal times. I don't need to go grocery shopping. and start to understand the whole product enormously and that was something like, oh my goodness, it's actually really worth getting them to have three boxes because then they'd become a sort of lifelong customer. And actually then we saw a referral explode because they basically became a salesperson for us because they'd go on their Instagram saying, look what I cooked last night. They'd tell everyone in their office or at the playground or whatever. Um, and trying to take that step back to be like, like what's actually the bigger picture here? Um, and that's when you just want to think about lifetime value rather than like one hit wonder. Hey, we actually had a, uh, a question here in the uh, chat from a uh, Marcel was asking about for, you know, for bride book, um, are you charging for the, uh, for the tool side as far as for planning and, and the venues or. No, so, so it's free for couples. And, uh, and then, so think of us like Google, um, free for couples and free for users. Uh, and then businesses can, can pay to do targeting. We've had some ideas of, you know, we could create some premium service for couples one day, and then hopefully living true to our word, right? We're keeping our focus and, you know, we can do that another day. Um, uh, I yeah. actually, I, I had a second sort of question. So I, like you, I'm in the live event space. And um, so 2020 for us became uh, massive, uh, supply and no demand, of course, because our clients were completely shut down on the seller and buyer side. And then 2021, when concerts began getting booked and weddings and uh, conventions and corporate meetings and etc., uh, the demand went completely nuts and, and supply went away because there were uh, you know, supply issues from manufacturers. So people went to pre-owned product, et cetera. Did you experience similar problems and how did you deal with that? Because obviously it's tough to have a wedding when you can't get a photographer or a... So we, so we were quite uh, protected from that due to the lead times of uh, weddings. So actually what happened is couples, there's no urgent, there's you know some urgency or sometimes life stage urgency of having a wedding. But actually what happened is the average engagement moved from about 19, 20 months at the start of COVID or just before COVID. At the end of COVID, the average engagement moved to 30 months because people moved their weddings out. So if you got engaged at the start of even this year, you are most likely be getting married in 2024 now. And like, um, the venue I'm in now, we have five weddings booked for 2025 because people move their date rather than saying like, I have to get married. And that sort of removes the, uh, the, you know, supply demand mismatch, um, but, and which, you know, will clear out over the next few years and, and go back to normal rather than this right. entity. The other challenge was a lot of suppliers wanted to put their prices up. But due to the long lead times, they get this very hard, you know, they have this long lag. So um, uh, a lot of people thought everyone would double their prices, but everything was already booked. So they just had to suck up missing two years of, of no business. 
which is how the economics should work. Hopefully, lots of your supply charged a bit more when the when the pressure was on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's we have products that like during 2020, for example, we're selling for fifteen thousand dollars. There's a particular lighting control desk that was selling for fifteen thousand. That's now about thirty to thirty three thousand. Uh, you know, it's crazy. And a brand new one is like 30. So right. it's crazy. Thanks. A great question. Hey, uh, so we have time for uh, one, one last question. Uh, Andrew, do you uh, want to jump on? Like a familiar face here. Hey, Hamish, how are you? You, you talked a lot about, um, you know, the HelloFresh experience, but also from the bride book perspective, I think one thing that I'd like to just hear more about from you is, is the sort of perseverance because I've, no, I've known you for a long time, obviously, and I've seen the business for a long time. And clearly like you have things like COVID that happen that you can't predict, but even beyond that, it's just like, how do you, how do you, you know, maintain the energy that you're heading in the right direction in a marketplace like this, that takes, you know, so many years to achieve liquidity and, and to achieve, um, scale. So, so the, so the one question is kind of two questions in one, one yeah, is like, cool. what advice would you have to the people here that are in the early days and, and trying to like find a signal that they can latch on to and, 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 and pull on. And the second question is, have you seen it get easier? Cause a lot of things we talk about marketplaces that I like is when they're working, they, they actually get easier because you get liquidity and as you, you the dam analogy is a really good one i think have you seen that yet you know at at bridebook or did you see that at HelloFresh? and i guess what sort of words of wisdom do you have for the earlier startups here in, in the so um the uh the i think uh well, i'll try and ask back then the perseverance one i think uh the the wedding industry because i've run this venue with my brothers, I've literally lived it for 15 years. It almost got killed during the credit crunch. Then it almost got killed during COVID. And it's something I'm like incredibly close to. And then we helped like thousands of businesses get through COVID. And uh, the, yeah, we set up the Association of British Wedding Businesses and we're fighting for grants and everything. That whole thing, people say like, it's going to be absolutely brutal. There are I really, really dark times. We went in like the depths of hell through COVID. Um, making sure, you know, if you're setting off now, if you're not that passionate about what they're doing, if you think, oh, it's a great way to get rich quick or something, okay, you're sort of completely wrong, and uh, and and it's and it's tough. Um, that bit of what I get motivated by is like uh, I, we've had 160 million guests at our weddings, about 160 million people dancing, partying, drinking, all that fun of a wedding. Like, and that's something I'm like, awesome. How the hell did that weird thing in my head once now Bray got hundred million people dancing and our whole goal in the company is the next five years, we're going to have a billion people at our weddings. And, and that's like, I bring it on. Even I get hit by a bus the next day, like I was, I'll be like, I, I won, you know, that's, you can see already, I'm just like, let's go for it. And it's like trying to, trying to uh, remind yourself of that. Um, I think it's also, uh, I, when I've had like those, those tough times is um, uh, trying to take that perspective, trying to think of taking a step back and like, oh, you're actually, you know, so lucky to have like control of your own destiny and have this opportunity. And if you've got team members who are like fighting it out with you, being like, wow, this is one of the most like interesting, exciting, you know, challenges, you know, anyone gets have a chance to do and that's just sort of metal. And hopefully um people find that sort of fire in them. It's great to have a, people to chat to or founders who are going through the same shit. My wife would send me these things of there are two types of founders. One is crying on the bathroom floor, the other is crying on the kitchen floor. And like, and you're like, oh, I get it now. Or it was like, oh, when I was a founder, I slept like a baby. I woke up every two hours crying. Like, just hearing that, being like, oh, I get it. It's not just me. I think um, 
is is really helpful in those in those in those times. Um, and then does it get um, does it get any easier? I think there's there's moments of um, uh, where it's like, oh my god, it was this mountain we thought we we would never climb over, and we got to the top, and you're like, brilliant. And now, annoyingly, it looks like a hill, and you spotted your next mountain, and and I think people are sort of, well, I'm ambitious. We're like, do no, we want that? billion people partying and and you know help will to help over a million business and like uh that uh i don't think it necessarily gets um uh easier but definitely going through all this shit sorry you saw it again uh teaches you like that you know i know in the next three months you know grenade is going to go off somewhere or whatever and it's like oh don't freak out you've seen 50 of these now like um and your initial reaction all pretty much always is like oh god it's going to be the end of everything and then 48 hours later you've forgotten about it and you're back climbing up the mountain and um uh and i think actually you know when the best learned is like unfortunately you only learn that through experience um I'll finish on this. I hope it's, I don't know if it's just me or I'm just rambling to myself now, but like um, uh, a quote that really resonates for me is like, um, the universe was waiting for 13 billion years for you to turn up. And then you're going to be sitting in whatever happens after your life for about 44 billion years until the universe like collapses in on itself, so basically. So you go in that little flash of time you've got, like go big go for it you know i'm so glad i didn't just sit there and be a banker i think if i sat there for 44 billion years and people said what did you do i was like oh i just became a banker i didn't really enjoy it and then i died it's like dead on the field and give it a go and uh and that hopefully gives me some fire uh most day I, I love it that's such a great way to uh wrap things up here so uh you know, might as well make the most of it and uh, take on a big challenge with uh, building marketplaces here. So, all right. Well, absolute pleasure. Anyone welcome to reach out for me, find me on LinkedIn or whatever, and happy to help. Yeah. Thanks again for taking the time to join us here today. This is a uh, really great. Yeah. So on, on that note too, how can we, uh, where can we keep up with you at as far as time for a quick plug? So, so definitely on LinkedIn. So if you look, there are not many Hamish's, Hamish Shepherd, um, it's finally there, but, um, uh, you'll get, I'm not that busy on it, but if you send me a DM, I, I can reply or just follow me and I, I post occasionally.